Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, <clears throat> on behalf of the organizers, I welcome you all to this conference on gender equality in the Arctic. We have ahead of us two very interesting and hopefully exciting days with a lot of lectures and discussions. I'm looking very much forward to this. Uh, before we start, there are a few practical things I need to mention. First of all, there is a person here among us who is extremely allergic to peppermint. So we kindly ask you not to use any kind of peppermint. That includes chewing gum, for example. This is a very serious problem that we need to react to. And then uh, there are uh, some persons here among us who uh, will have uh, some special food during the lunch. And uh, the food, there, there is a, there's a buffet here outside, but the food for the vegetarians or those with, with some kind of allergy are, at the, are behind where the servants are. We will show you when we come to that. But let's begin the program, and I give the word to the Foreign Minister of Iceland, Gunnar Bragi Svensson. The floor is yours. Madam President Tarja Hallonen, Mayor of Akureyri, Rector of the University of Akureyri, Distinguished guests, ladies and, and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to this international conference on gender equality in the Arctic. Akureyri is a capital of northern Iceland and a thriving center of Arctic research and education, hosting the University of Akureyri, a partner in the University of the Arctic, and host of the Secretariat for the Northern Research Forum. The Stefansson Arctic Institute is also located here, and the two Arctic Council Working Group Secretariats, uh, PAME and CAF, the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, as well as private entities such as the Arctic Portal and Arctic Services, all contributing to a strong knowledge base in Arctic science and information. Ladies and gentlemen, gender equality is an important policy priority for the government, both domestically and in our foreign policy. For the past six years, Iceland has been at the top of the Global Gender Gap Index of the World Economic Forum, meaning that it is the country with the narrowest gender gap in the world. We are proud of progress made in advancing gender equality. Nevertheless, we are fully aware of the number of challenges that we still need to address in our country. Only a week ago, I was a guest at the Government's Equality, Equality Action Fund. It was a conference where new ambitious research projects were awarded grants and conclusions from previous funded projects were presented. Among the completed projects was a study on how Iceland stands with regard to equal pay for equal work. The conclusion, was, uh, the conclusion of the research was to indicate that 8.4% uh, unexplained difference between men and women. We obviously need to make an effort to close the gender wage gap. Internationally, we remain committed to advocating actively for gender equality, including in the deliberations for a new development agenda to be adopted in 2015. Next year, we will also celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Fourth World Conference of Women and the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. 20 years on, the Beijing Platform for Action remains an important framework for for advancing gender equality. Countries must use the occasion to strengthen implementation of the commitments they made in Beijing in September 1995. In this context, we find it particularly important to engage men and boys in the discourse on how to achieve gender equality in a positive and constructive way. As the United Nations, Iceland and Suriname have partnered to lead a French group of countries to galvanize support for gender equality 
and to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. Together, Iceland and Suriname will convene what we call a barbershop conference at the UN headquarters in New York in January 2015. The aim is to mobilize men and boys into a proactive commitment to gender equality in order to change the discourse among men and boys. The conference will enlist men leaders and agents and stakeholders who through their own actions and engagement can work toward the positive transformation of social norms, attitudes and gender stereotypes. A special focus will be on violence against women and how men can join forces to end it. This initiative has already received considerable attention. And to be honest, responses have been both positive and negative. Allow me therefore to use this opportunity to make clear that the idea is not in any way to exclude women from the discussion. We are simply trying to stress the importance of bringing men and boys to the table as well in order to achieve our common goal of a world without a gentle discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nordic Council of Ministers, where Iceland currently holds the presidency, is one example on how we try to strengthen our international engagement on gender equality. The Nordic countries have been in the forefront in this field, with each country benefiting from the experience of others. In our presidency program, named Vig Vigor and Vitality, the spotlight is on equal rights and equal status in the labor market. The gender segregated labor market and ways to combine family life and work. The Arctic Council has admittedly been less focused on gender equality. Although several chairmanships have highlighted gender equality issues, they have not featured prominently in the work of the Arctic Council during the past decade. At the same time, Arctic states have promoted gender equality and women's empowerment in other international fora, such as in the United Nations. But even though the focus on gender issues has been sporadic in the Arctic Council, efforts have been made to increase our knowledge and understanding of the gender perspective in the Arctic context with research, conferences, and discussions. Let me mention a few examples. In August 2002, Finland, in cooperation with the Arctic Council and the Nordic Council of Ministers, organized a conference on gender equality and women in the Arctic entitled Taking Wing. The conference focused mainly on the three broad uh, themes women at work, gender and the self-determination of indigenous people and violence against women. At the third ministerial meeting of the Council in Finland, the recommendation of the conference were noted and the ministers explicitly encouraged the integration of gender equality and women and youth perspectives in all efforts to enhance living conditions, conditions in the Arctic. And furthermore, they recognize the crucial role of women in developing viable Arctic communities. At the same meeting, Iceland took over the chairmanship from Finland. The Iceland chairmanship put strong emphasis on enhancing the human dimension with the framework of the Arctic Council. The first Arctic Human Development Report was the main project of the coming two years chairmanship. When presented in 2004 at the Arctic Council Ministerial Meeting in Reykjavik, the report was to become the most comprehensive assessment on human conditions in the Arctic. The meeting recommended that it be used as the Arctic Council's knowledge base for the Sustainable Development Program and serve to direct the relevant working groups of the Council to consider follow-up actions. The report included an important chapter on gender issues, addressing many critical matters such as men's changing roles in society, women's security and violence against them, job opportunities as well as issues of power and control. Now, bringing us closer in time, later this fall, the second Arctic Human Development Report will be published 10 years after the first edition. In the new report, gender issues are mainstreamed uh, into each chapter, rather than being addressed as a separate subject. The Stephenson Arctic Institute Institute is also leading the work on this second report with great support from Canada and Greenland. I'm very pleased to note that some of the authors contributing 
to both of these reports are here today to share the knowledge and experience. My hope is that the recommendations from this edition of the report will be implemented more effectively than 10 years ago, resulting in a more systematic integration of gender perspective in the work of the Arctic Council. Ladies and gentlemen, one year ago, Iceland put forward a proposal at the Arctic Council with the aim to promote extensive policy-relevant dialogue on gender equality in the Arctic region in the context of current realities, as well as future challenges. Since then, we have worked with our partners in the circumpolar, circumpolar region to organize this conference in order to open and strengthen our dialogue, as well as to seek suggestions, suggestions for possible measures and follow-up actions. When preparing this conference, we have tried to build on earlier work and conferences. During the next couple of days, we will address some of the pressing issues already identified, like gender and natural resource management, women's representation, participation in, and involvement in de decision-making, processes and security. Other important topics related to imbalanced sex ratio, which negatively affects the resilience and development of Arctic communities. And ladies and gentlemen, as you have heard, Iceland has put great effort in advancing public debate and research on gender issues. This subject remains an integral part of our Arctic policy to strengthen social well-being and support sustainable human development in the region. The changes we are witnessing in the Arctic, ecological, social, or economic, are affecting both and women, and sometimes in different ways. But our common goal remains the same, to secure equal opportunities for both men and women to achieve the life they desire and the world without gender discrimination. I am well aware that one conference can never cover all the factors affecting gender equality and human well-being in the Arctic. However, based on a promising program before us, I know that the discussion will go far and wide over the next two days. I am confident that this conference will contribute to a strong cooperation, cooperation uh, network of various stakeholders res researching, teaching and promoting gender equality in the Arctic. We will publish a comprehensive follow-up report from this event with key con conclusions and recommendations and present it at the Arctic Council before its next ministerial meeting in April in Canada. But before giving the floor to the real expert and strong advocate to gender, for gender equality, Madam President Hallonen, I want to thank Finland, Sweden, Norway, the Faroe Islands, Aliwood Inter International Association, the Nordic Council of Ministers, and the Arctic Council for the strong support. And last but not least, I thank the Icelandic Center for Gender Equality, the Stefansson's Arctic Institute, the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, and everyone who has worked very hard with us to organize this conference. Now I would, I would like to ask you to give President Halloween a warm welcome. Thank you. So, Mr. Foreign Minister, and all other excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to be here again. So, um, and it's also an honor to be here today to discuss the efforts towards a greater gender equality in the Arctic. I would like to extend my warmest thanks to the organizers also on my behalf for the gathering and inviting all of us to this important conference. So, as it was already mentioned, 12 years ago, in 2002, Finland organized the Arctic Council Gender Equality Conference entitled Taking Wing in Lapua. Um, and um, it was um, the Arctic Council's first conference focusing on the promotion of the gender equality. Three themes were discussed in the conference, women and work, gender, self-determination, uh, and then the third one was the violence against women. So, still the topic items today. 
Today, we will discuss the current realities and the future challenges concerning gender equality in the Arctic. So, um, it's always very important to balance. So, thanks for every one of you who have made a progress during these years. Uh, but despite progress made in terms of the commitments to women's rights and gender equality during the last decade, so women and girls still suffer from violence and discrimination across the, uh, across the globe. And, sorry to say, also here in, in Arctic. At the same time, the Arctic is facing a number of other challenges, such as the climate change, youth unemployment, and the women's out-migration. And we need closer and broader co <coughs> cooperation and more efficient work with partners both in the Arctic and beyond to tackle these issues and other challenges. So I take only a few parts, and I know that you will have a wonderful conference after our opening remarks. So first, the economic policies have different implications for women and men. However, according to research and statistics, gender equality is a really smart economics. It's a smart investment. It can enhance economic efficiency and improve a broad range of development outcomes. The economies are also larger and more versatile when both men and women participate fully as equals. The continued domination of one gender is not smart policy. So I always underline, it's right and it's smart. In practice, this means that the needs of women and girls must also be better taken into account when considering cuts to public spending, which is today very uh, ad hoc, uh, very important issue, at least in Finland. It's, it's highly important, for example, that the sexual and reproductive health services are provided despite long distances. A woman can be an active participant in her society and community only if her sexual and reproductive health and rights are fully fulfilled. So I always say that, like our mothers and grandmothers said, it starts from home. Another serious obstacle in the full enjoyment of human rights for women and girls is the subject of violence against women, including trafficking and prostitution. So intervening in violent situations can be particularly difficult <coughs> in small communities where everybody knows everybody. So it's also difficult for a victim to get the special care and attention in a small community for fear and being stigmatized. So we all know that in our small communities, it's a good side and bad sides that everybody knows everybody. So, however, coordinated efforts to prevent this phenomenon, to protect victims and punish the perpetrators must be continued. Everyone must have the right to live without violence or fear of it. So, problems related uh, to women's ownership, inheritance and control and management of natural, natural resources also hinder women's opportunities in Arctic, but it's even more visible in, in other parts of the world. Climate change is very likely to affect the productivity and the use of land, and thus further increases the fragility related to land ownership. Therefore, discussions on climate change, gender equality, ownership, and control rights, and environmental protection must be closely interlinked. The, the law and equal and effective access to justice must be safeguarded for everyone. So both women and men, indigenous and non-indigenous people, must have equal opportunities to take part in political, economic, cultural and social life and decision making, and leadership at all levels. Women can also, for example, offer knowledge, skills, and first-hand experience of many practical aspects of life that we have so far been left in the shadows. So it's very important exactly in this historical situation. As an importance of the Arctic is growing, as you know, and it's even more important to involve a greater number of women in the Arctic governing bodies, administrations, and businesses, and, and, we, and I also would say that look for the experts. 
So um, when women have an equal opportunities to participate in decision making and have an equal access to labor markets, also the impetus uh, for out migration declines. So dear friends, when uh, discussing gender equality, I was so happy when I heard these opening words because the role of the men and boys must not be underestimated. They have a crucial role to play in women's empowerment. I strongly encourage all of us to think how men could be brought in as even more active partners in this collaboration. Let me mention here the He for She campaign, which was launched by the UN Women in New York in September. Um, so I was witnessing, I was also there in that meeting, um, and uh, I think that the idea is to create a vast solidarity movement in which men across the globe commit to take action against um, all kinds of uh, forms of violence and discrimination uh, faced by women and men. And so I challenge all men here also to visit the website for he for c uh, org and sign up. I normally I encourage men in Finland, I say that it, uh, it takes a very short time, it doesn't cost, and it's not painful, just sign it. <laughs> because it can have also a lot of, lot of good consequences in practical life. So, then to conclude, many of the challenges in the Arctic are of a global nature, and some are maybe more regionally and culturally specific. We are working on many fronts to find solutions, to find a path towards a more sustainable global development model, which is a key also to survival and well-being of the Arctic regions. So it's very often misunderstanding that we would hope to get a warmer climate, we in the north. No, not polar bear, not us. So we have understood and agreed that the sustainable future entails that all three aspects, the social, economic, and environmental, they are addressed as we make decisions about how to tackle the common challenges that accompany us in the future. We also know that we need all our human potential and capital to find a new way. So 50% of the human resources, men, and 50% of the human resources, the women. They are not separately enough. They had to be 100%. So easy. So um, a lot of human resources are still untapped. In Brazil, at the Rio Plus 20, 10, 20 summit, um, we agreed that especially the creative talents of young and too many women are underused, uh, and so are the skills and experience of the experiences of the poor. I think that, the, as a co-chairman of that, I, I, I I think that the biggest victory we got there is to see that if the people have to take the responsibility of the future of the planet, so we have also to empower them to take this responsibility, starting from our home and, and going to all around in different sectors of the society. And that has been already somehow agreed. I mean, not only at Rio, but also afterwards. They say that, okay, we need all the, all the resources. But the consequences, how to do it, that's still in half a way. So I, I want to stress here again that the gender equality is not, the, not only a human rights issue, but it's also an economic, social, and development issue. It's a smart investment in the future of, of humankind. So dear friends, I believe that together we will make this conference fruitful. We will generate and provide the Arctic Council, the national and regional bodies, and each other of us more tools and ideas to work with even more energy and efficiency towards greater gender equality in the Arctic. So I will speak here only now in the opening, but I will listen to you really with a great interest because I will say that I will use your uh, knowledge and your experience also in the future, next time in Geneva, then in Bhutan, in Nepal, and so on, and tell that how good you are. So try to be good ones. So I, I think that uh, just uh, mentioning also out of the written text, um, it was uh, this autumn, it was 20 years from Cairo. In Cairo, um, uh, there was a great conference 
uh, where we notice that um, population and development has a certain uh, context to each other. And um, then during these 20 years, we have made a progress, but it's, it's fantastic to see that 20 years ago, people were in many cases more progressive than what they are today. And that cooperation together with UNFPA, I think that you say in, in, in Icelandic, no, UNFPA. So, so um, we, we succeeded to get now some further implementations. And that work was done very much with uh, Finland and Denmark, and, and of course with other Nordics and Netherlands and so on. Um, and I know that this kind of the Nordic cooperation can be very helpful, not only in finance, but also in other way around. And that's why I do welcome now that, uh, that uh, you and uh, Iceland and Sweden will now to take the burden to, to take forward the Beijing Plus 20. Because uh, we really need this kind of the cooperation. And uh, I, I will say only that uh, we need a very successful conference here to put all this to, uh, forward, and I'm very, very uh, convinced that you will do that. So let's start this wonderful seminar. Thank you very much.